All right, friends. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. This is What's Growing On, and we are here, as all, always, with our awesome Executive Director of Victory Teaching Farm, Tarrant Lanier. Good morning, Tarrant. Good morning. And today, um, Tarrant introduced me to some awesome folks, um, Veronica and Donald Culberson, and they are a father-daughter duo who are really into beekeeping and bee conservation. So we are really, really, really lucky to have uh, them talking to us this month and next month. Uh, this month, they're gonna be talking about just the importance of bees and kind of how to attract bees to your garden and um, the ecology of bees and all that great stuff. And then next month, we're gonna be actually talking about kind of beginner beekeeping and, and some tips and techniques on that. So please feel free to ask um, any questions you have in the chat. And once we get towards the end, we'll have um, time if you'd like to uh, ask a question off of chat, you can do that as well. But I am gonna be moderating chat as we go through it. And um, without further ado, I um, am going to introduce you to Don and Veronica Col Culberson. And Don is a 25 year professor of biology at Spring Hill College, go Badgers. Um, where he teaches entomology, among many other things. Um, I think uh, I actually took uh, genetics from Dr. Culberson a while back. So, and it was a fun class. I really, I really enjoyed that. And um, Veronica is also a graduate of uh, Spring Hill College, and she has grown up um, loving science and, and being in an outdoorsy family. Um, she naturally found a place for plants and insects in her everyday life. And so they both enjoy sharing their love and knowledge of nature with others. So we're, again, very lucky to have you guys here today. Welcome. And um, I'm going to let y'all just kind of start telling us about bees and how you got started in this. All right. We would love to. So there we are in front of one of our beehives. Uh, obviously, it was a good day from the smiles on our faces. The uh, reason we actually first got into beekeeping, I guess, well... I had thought about doing beekeeping for quite a while. I, I'm I'm uh, older than some of my colleagues here at the college, and I knew that retirement was coming up before too many years. I'm not ready to go yet, but I needed I knew I'd need things to do, and I thought beekeeping is something I've thought about for a long time, and it would be fun. And uh, so, but of course, like most things, I thought about it and thought about it and didn't do it. And then um, we were having trouble with our garden. Um, this was really embarrassing, but we couldn't grow squash or melons. And when you can't grow squash or melons in Alabama, then something's wrong. And so our, we'd grow beautiful squash plants and they'd grow beautiful flowers and there'd be beautiful tiny little squash and then they would wither and fall off the plant. And the reason for that was pretty obviously that they weren't getting pollinated. So we <laughs> kind of started down this path. Uh, ironically, it turns out that bees uh, honeybees do not pollinate squash or uh, melon plants, uh, but it got us going and it got us thinking about pollination. I noticed on the previous slide, it said something about the importance of bees or saving the bees or whatever, and that will be one of our topics, I mean, what we talk about, but um, really we're going to talk about some other pollinators as well. There are many, many things besides bees, and actually there are a couple of thousand or more species of bees in the United States that pollinate things. And uh, obviously we raise honeybees. Um, so we've always loved bugs. I've been kind of a, an amateur entomologist. Well, I teach entomology here at the college. I've been into that for quite some time. And um, as I said, I was looking at it as a possible retirement uh, activity. And then of course the other thing is it's grown, <laughs> our beekeeping has grown well beyond what I ever anticipated it would. Uh, and so my daughter and I get to uh, do this together and that's uh, kind of a, productive uh you know thing we can do together actively and then of course it also produces honey yes we get honey and other products actually well beeswax and a variety of things so yeah yep so um you want to move to the next slide and we'll start with uh with what types of pollinators there are and why they're all important so these are some some photos here i've taken of uh some of our local pollinators um and uh, you can see they're all very beautiful. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and colors. Um, and like um, my dad was saying, uh, there's a 
about 4,000 species of native bees in the U.S. And there's also thousands of native wasps, butterflies, moths, beetles, ants, all sorts of insects that pollinate. Um, and then beyond that, hummingbirds pollinate, other birds do, uh, mammals, bats, little mice, anything, lizards, all sorts of things can pollinate. Um, so uh, pollinating, pollination is, is, we see it most important to us for food, obviously. Uh, if, if like the squash and the melons, if they don't get pollinated enough, they don't form viable fruits and then we don't have food to eat. So uh, pollination is very important to us. And um, we want, uh, Dorothy, if you want to change the next slide, yeah. there's some more. And I was going to ask if you, um, if you don't mind, I, I did have a quick question about the carpenter yeah. bee because I know I actually saw somebody asking this on, on Facebook this morning, a friend of mine, but, um, you know, we, we see carpenter bees and we think of them almost like a pest because they like to bore into our houses. And so do you have some tips on maybe some safe ideas on, you know, uh, safe for our house, safe for the bees? Um, to, to yeah, kind of deter the, um, them from that? The, the, the best uh, method is prevention. So keeping um, your, your wood painted, obviously, uh, going around in the fall and, and filling any of the old carpenter bee holes um, it, with caulk and then painting fresh over them. Um, I don't ever want to suggest pesticides. Uh, if, if it's the most dire situation, then, um, you know, make sure you use something that's going to soak into the wood and, and not spread into the environment, um, not be broadcast. Um, and the best thing really, though, is, is to uh, give them other places to live. So you could take an old log and um, start drilling some holes in it or uh, put up a four by four post of untreated lumber and drill some holes in it. And then you also see the cute little bee houses mm -hmm. that people make online with bamboo and um, different size, you know, little cavities uh, for them to move into. Um, mason bees and carpenter bees, they, they wanna come back to, um, they, they live several years and they will actually come back to the same hole year after year. So if, oh. if their previous hole is filled up or if it's an undesirable location and there's a better location nearby they'll they'll go use it so okay. you know try to try to give them some place better to live and um, then just try to keep your wood painted yeah. okay those are great 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 tips so like you said I mean putting a log or a post out and drilling some holes for them because that's where they have their baby bees, right? That's where they're yeah. making a nest. They're not just destroying your wood to destroy it. That's actually no, they're not. They they're not eating wood. They're in right. there laying laying an egg and coming back with pollen and nectar to feed that baby and grow it. Um, and then, actually, um, you know, it, it at the end of the season they abandon the the hole there. So mm -hmm. it's the queen doesn't even over overwinter in that hole. So okay. you can, okay. at that point you can fill it. Right. And, and just to just re, just to All reiterate, right. I mean, they're not just drilling holes in your porch; they're right. pollinating. <laughs> yeah, right. they're they so. they're a very important job. Yes, yeah. right. and so, they're and they're drilling holes to make more pollinators. Make babies, so, right? Yes. Right. You guys so. like babies, right? Exactly, cute little baby bees. So awesome. Well, that those are some great tips because I know. Yes, Jarrett. I have a follow up question to that because yeah. we are struggling with them right now. Um, and so we, um, we had done the, the filling of the holes and all that, and they ate right through the caulk to go back in. Um, yes. So once they get inside, so they're not, once they get inside, they're not just boring out the entire inside of our, our fascia board or anything like that. They're making the one hole to get into their little safe spot. And then right, that's and, and then that's it. And um, if they've already laid an egg in that hole, they will dig out whatever you put in it. If you put concrete in it, they will dig a hole next to it to get to that egg. So mm -hmm. um, that's why I say do it in do it in the fall or do it, you know, late summer once all their baby making stuff is over with. And then you know by the time they come back and it's it's painted and you know yeah okay. 
That's good to know that those mama bees are persistent, which I mean, as a mama, who wouldn't be, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Your baby's in there. You right. got to go take care of your baby. Um, also, I've had a, a lot of people talking to me about the carpenter bees this year. So I think they're having a really, really good year, which we should all be grateful for because they yeah. are very great pollinators. That's Actually, good. as an entomology professor, uh, I've noticed the last two years, I don't know whether it's pandemic related or what, but bee diversity and biomass have both increased uh, noticeably. Yes. Great. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay. So we move on to our next one. I had no idea we had this many um, different types of bees and, and wasps out here. So let's look at these. Yeah. And uh, that's a, a bumblebee nest in the bottom picture there. Um, bumblebees nest underground. Uh, which oh. is really cool. And they usually in the springtime will, um, a queen bumblebee will find like an old rodent's nest or an old log that's left sort of a cavity under it. And she'll go and, and make all these little cocoons and lay eggs in each one and take care of them all. It's, it's sweet. Um, so uh, diversity is is a big thing when, when we're talking about pollinators, because um, as dad mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the honeybees, aren't really too interested in the squash and the watermelons. They'll, they'll work on them if that's all there is, but um, a watermelon flower has to be pollinated. It has to be visited something like 28 times in order to produce a watermelon. So wow. um, they're, they're really pollinated by a, a particular bee called squash bees and bumblebees do that. Um, so it's really important to have a variety of pollinators around to, uh, to take care of, of all the flowers. Um, Many, like, a, yeah, a lot of the fruits and flowers have specific pollinators to them. Uh, chocolate. Everybody likes chocolate, right? Oh, yes. So, Dad, you want to tell them about chocolate? Yeah, so uh, I was uh, looking uh, up to see what, uh, what kind of things uh, mosquitoes happen to pollinate. And, of course, we know that uh, female mosquitoes are the ones that drink our blood. Uh, they only do that when it's reproduction time to, to make eggs. It takes that kind of energy to do so. But both the males and the females go to uh, flowers of a variety of sort for nectar um, on the off season. And uh, it turns out that uh, the cacao tree uh, that makes chocolate, uh, people ask me what good are mosquitoes? And I say, well, they are a big important part of the food chain, but uh, chocolate, <laughs> so, um, so and midges uh, also, they're very similar insects. Uh, that's kind of an amusing uh, sideline that mosquitoes have. So yep. they pollinate chocolate. Yeah. Yep. We need, we need wow. mosquitoes for chocolate. Sorry, That's guys. Crazy. So, oh, but the, man. <laughs> yeah, everything has its place. Yeah. Don, you need to watch it because we're going to have to have a whole episode on just insects in your yard in general if you're not careful. So this is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> So um, also it's more than just insects that pollinate, like we said earlier, um, their bats pollinate night blooming flowers and uh, cactuses and moths do also. So they're, you know, we need pollinators at all times of the day and night, and there's all different sorts for it. Right. Um, and I would assume that if you're, if you're putting pesticides where these bugs and stuff can get to them or the pollinators can get to them and, you know even if the, the bats may not be affected you know by it on contact they, they can are. eat the bugs and get you know like yeah. the birds can yeah. still eat the bugs and get it and be have a problem right so. and 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 we're going to get more into pesticides in a minute but yeah. um bat small animals like the bats and the hummingbirds are just as susceptible to those poisons as the bees and the, the moths and the butterflies. Yeah. Um, and uh, my, my biggest thing with the pesticides in the environment, um, especially the mosquito sprays, is that the mosquitoes life cycle is a week. They can breed in, in a matter of days, whereas all these wasps and, and moths and things live longer, months, some of them even mm -hmm a year or more and it, they take months to breed and so when the poisons kill everything off those mosquitoes come right back mm -hmm. and everything else is gone so mm -hmm. you know we, we really avoiding pesticides is the most important if they take anything away from this talk today avoiding pesticides is, is the most important part right. and um, there's so many that and Tarrant has talked about before too like you know organic type 
you know, deterrents and things, you know, spices and stuff like that. Right. You know, right. Plants yeah. you can plant around your garden that, that keep, bugs, keep bugs away without harming them. So yeah. there's plenty and of then, options. Yes. And also if you, if you don't use pesticides in your yard, then those predatory bugs are going to come back and they're going to do that job. Mm-hmm. Um, we see, we don't use any poisons. We ask our neighbors not to, to use poisons um, whenever, you know, whenever possible, uh, still being nice neighbors. Mm-hmm. And um, we've seen an increase in, in ladybugs and predatory wasps. Um, I haven't seen a tomato hornworm in, on our tomatoes in several years now. And I know that other people are dealing with them. And I think it's the amount of wasps that we have around. Right. They take care of it. So, um, and then also what you mentioned about, uh, you know, the bats eating the mosquitoes and, or, or the insects that have been affected by the chemicals. Um, so it, it does travel up through the food web. Mm-hmm. And then also as, um, you know, as we know, insects are dying off, bees are dying off, uh, we're losing species just at an alarming rate and that ticks up the food chain. It affects the birds now, we're losing tons of birds and small animals. And, um, you know, we need a, a variety and diversity of, of everything for a healthy mm-hmm. environment. Well, and, and I think you and I have talked about like um, the almond growers in California. It's like they, they've farmed everything to such an extent that they actually have to, in order to get the almonds that they're growing Pollinate. for, they have to bring, actually bring the pollinators into the orchards. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And, and they yeah, bring in, wanna... they bring in up to hundreds of hives on the back of big semi trucks and uh, place them in the, uh, in the groves. They do that in Florida too, for citrus uh, crops and uh-huh. several, yeah. 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 And actually, if you want to move to the next slide, sure. we'll get started talking about uh, the odds that are stacked against the pollinators. So... Dad, you want to talk about this little graph um, about how just pesticides spread out into the environment? Sure. Um, so I, I, I'll add also that uh, we all are familiar with the mosquito trucks that um, that travel down the street on a periodic basis. I guess we had ours turned off. Is that did you call them, Veronica? Yeah, uh, a lot of our neighbors have called them. Um, mostly Beth. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you can you can have that stopped on your street. However, I will add that. Uh, the people that do that, that are behind that, um, do so as responsibly as you can. Uh, mm-hmm. The uh, insecticides that they're used um, basically break down in the sunlight. Uh, so they, they have a very short half-life uh, during the day. So what they do is they uh, spray um, in the evening or at around dusk or in the evening. And most of the pollinators, well, the daytime pollinator at least, are have gone home at that point in time. We have all our hives uh, a couple of hundred feet from the road, so they're pr- pretty much out of the range of that anyway, and they're in their hive, and then as soon as the sun comes out the next morning, theoretically at least, and I think this is the case, the uh, the pesticides that are being sprayed for mosquitoes primarily begin to dissipate as the uh, bees start their, start their day, so still, uh, I haven't really noticed any problem with mosquitoes in our neighborhood uh, in particular. Maybe the bats are... Uh, are thriving so um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, plants actually uh, take up uh, some of the pesticides that are used and uh, you may end up having them in your diet I think uh, Tarrant uh, runs an operation where we avoid that if I'm not mistaken uh, we've, we've never really met but uh, but uh, foods uh, organically grown foods uh, certainly taste better in my experience in my experience um, the uh, various types of uh, pesticides work their way into the soil and they can affect not only the pests that they're after, the insect pests that they're after, but also uh, various microbes in the uh, in the soil. Anyone who does any gardening at all uh, probably has a, a compost to pile somewhere nearby. And uh, the breakdown products um, of the leaves and other detritus that goes into a compost pile become incredibly important nutrients for uh, for plant crops that we that we try to grow. And they do so because of the various microbes that are in the uh, soil that take care of that. There are also some insects and insect relatives in that soil. Uh, again, in my, in my entomology class, we usually do some soil samples and just see what's crawling around in the uh, compost. And you'd be astonished at the uh, critters that are there. And their, their, their full purpose in life is not to pollinate, but to break down the stuff that the uh, leaf litter and uh, other organic detritus that uh, plants can use to grow. And so 
um, hate hate that it does that. Uh, a variety of when we spray into the air, there are a variety of environmental conditions, particularly a wind and rain that can spread the, uh, the droplets a lot further than maybe they're intended in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, smaller droplets uh, dissipate, uh, they uh, carry further, but they dissipate faster. And then large droplets fall faster, but they tend to stay on the target um, faster. Um, obviously, uh, anytime that it does rain and there's any pesticides or other herbicides or whatever in the air, then uh, those are going to be carried into the water table and uh, spread out underneath the soil. Um, so, uh, yeah. And so it puts all those microbes and all of those right. good insects underneath the soil in danger. And right. Arnick, I know you and I were talking even about some frogs that have had some effects from pesticides. I mean, pretty Frog Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And Jarrett and I have talked about that too. That um, mm. there was a study on some some frogs that were changing gen changing sex based on uh, their exposure to pesticides. There also was a study of um, some uh, some villages, I think, down in South America. I think it was in Chile, where um, the children, uh, elementary school age children, five six year olds and from two villages, were uh, one was a farming village that used pesticides, and one was uh, more organic. And um, the children that were exposed to the pesticides were were very, very far behind the other children in um, their uh, mental development and their ability to write and draw and things like that. Um, so it, it, it's affecting all of us and uh, pesticides are, are, are a big dangerous problem. Yeah. Um, you wanna go to the next, sure. next slide? Just cute little picture. Y'all don't use poisons, please. They hurt the bees. Um, another big problem uh, with the, uh, pollinators are facing is that there's 100 million acres of pristine lawns, asphalt, and concrete pollinator dead zones in the U.S. So these are lawns where, where nothing else is allowed to grow uh, except grass, which does nothing but suck up water and energy and time. Um, and, you know, of course, asphalt and concrete, they make the world hotter. There's nothing can grow there. Um, and then uh, you talked about the the, uh, the almond fields, monocropping mm -hmm. and industrial farming adds m millions more acres of pollinator dead zones because when you have something like almonds where they, they keep the fields clean of any other plants, there is nothing blooming all year long except for when it's time for the almonds. And so the whole rest of the year, there's no, not a, a pollinator around for miles and miles and miles. That's why they have to bring the bees in. And that's, you know, we're, yeah. Part of the problem is um, also uh, industrial farming. You think about, you know, cattle farms, the things that take up large area like that, or also produce um, waste runoff that gets into the environment. Um, the, you know, the, the chemicals, the herbicides and pesticides they use in the in the almond fields to keep the other things from growing. It, it all straight into, the, straight into the water table. Yeah, all, and actually the bees that are used to pollinate uh, big monocropped areas like that and that they're exposed to the, the pesticides and they, um, beekeepers just, uh, when they agree to pollinate like that, they account for a certain amount of loss of their colonies from it. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, dangerous. And oh. then... Uh, the last big thing really facing the pollinators is the uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if y'all have noticed, I'm sure y'all have noticed that, uh, you know, our bloom times are a little bit different the last few years. And um, the, uh, the, the weather, um, I know last summer we um, had a really slow honey season because we kept going between drought and torrential downpours. And um, so, you know, that wasn't it when it was dry, things weren't blooming. And when it was really, really wet, the bees couldn't get out to work. Yeah. Plus the blossoms were getting knocked off of the bloom. Yeah. 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 So. So lots of things are stacked against them. And, and again, you know, the importance, the importance of bees is if they're not here, then we don't have food essentially. I mean, they are, they are kind of the crux of, of how we, how we get our produce, you know? Yes. Right. Yes. So, and, and I love this picture. This is a yard. This is a yard on drugs. I think that's a, that's a great, easy way to kind of look at it and see it. And um, it was funny. My husband was out doing yard work 
and he was like, I'm going to put some weed and feed. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> after, after we, um, you know, talked on Friday, I was like, no, 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 don't put the weed and feed out. <laughs> so let, let those little, let those little clovers grow. I mean, they, they add sprinkles of color to your yard. I mean, look at this picture. There's, yeah. there's, you know, one is a, a blank canvas that you can't even let your children and pets on. And, and the other one is, is beautiful and, and colorful and, um, and it's full of life. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite things um, as a boy mom is when we're out in the yard and my little boys bring me clovers and yes. and little wildflowers and stuff like that. I mean, obviously they're not going to pick all of them, but it's really sweet. So, well, and if they did, it would be really sweet. And, and yeah. if they weren't there, they wouldn't be able to do that. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, sorry, ahead, I wanted to mention something. Yeah. So one thing, so if, if you're somebody who prefers a, a, a green grass yard, or maybe you live in a neighborhood that it would not go over well if your yard was gorgeous and beautiful like the top yard and wasn't a, a, a green, just oasis of grass, um, you don't necessarily have to use fertilizers and things like that to have a, a beautiful lawn. Um, you can, I mean, we, we mulch our leaves into, because we've got lots of trees, um, and we do have a, a grass front lawn, um, but we also have flower beds with lots of flowers around and, um, you know, try to have a balance of that, but um, we mulch our leaves back into our, our, our front yard, um, mm -hmm. which helps to keep those nutrients in the soil, and, um, and our yard, I mean, we have Unfortunately, neighbors um, that use certain companies that will come out and, and put full applications to, to help them to have a beautiful green, you know, mm -hmm. front lawn. Um, and they don't have to do that. I mean, we don't. Right. And our grass a lot of times looks better than <laughs> some of the other neighbors who do have these businesses coming out. So that's another thing. I mean, yes, you, you want people to, to look at avoiding fertilizers and lawn applications and things like that and go more towards the top. But again, if you don't want to take that route, there are ways to still have a healthy lawn that's not going to impact um, our pollinators and our, you know, our birds and our bees and so forth. Sure. Yeah, you can, right. you can definitely still have a lawn without right. um, poisoning the environment. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, adding compost or making a li liquid compost Mm -hmm. from, you know, to, to fertilize your lawn with, or um, aquarium water for, from, you know, or pond water, anything, you know, to, to get that nutrient that the grass needs. Um, and then also, you know, uh, if you do live in a neighborhood that requires a specific type of lawn and that kind of stuff, um, mostly they'll let you get away with borders, with flowers, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, around the around the edges of the yard and little beds and that kind of thing. And you um, always have your backyard and, you know, right. and stuff like that. And right. Yeah. Um, so let's move into uh, how, um, how, how we can help the pollinators. And I love this because so, I, after seeing these pictures, I went um, on a walk and started trying to point out all of these because we have so many of these, you know, around around you know Alabama and especially down here in Mobile so uh, it's really it's really easy and really nice and they're all beautiful so yeah yeah and uh some of these are native and some may not be in the next few slides um uh so the most important way we can help the pollinators what we've been talking about mm -hmm. avoiding poisons avoiding the man-made chemicals um going more natural when you're talking about uh, fertilizing and, and planting and that sort of thing. Um, the second most important thing is, is leave the leaves where you can, mm -hmm. uh, because that's where the insects um, live and breed. That's where they lay their eggs. That's where they have their babies. That's where the lightning bugs come from. So if you can, if you can rake all those leaves to one area and, and leave them there, or if you can leave them spread out or, um, you know, maybe mulch them, like Terrence says, and, and um, some of that stuff still survives and, and you know, can populate your area. So um, uh, the lawn, mow less often, 
let let some of those little flowers grow through a little bit taller um, or have a little bit less lawn, you know, do the borders or uh, if you want even maybe small trails of lawn and big patches of wildflowers, that would be ideal. That's sort of how we have our yard. We let it grow wild and I sort of mow paths through where where we need to go. Um, I've, been, I've been trying to reforest our lawn since before Veronica was born. So... Uh, <laughs> that's yeah. awesome and these are and and like the camellia up here you know we're our yard has a ton of camellias in it and um so we're very fortunate and it's you know it's always fun to um see the bees and go around and even the the title picture was one that I actually took in my yard the black and white with the bee um on one of our um the camellia bushes you know and so it's it's you know not just you know, the, the lower to the ground stuff. No, you can have big, beautiful showstopper flowers like right. that. Um, just, you want to look for things that, uh, that, that produce a lot of pollen and nectar. Um, camellias are mm -hmm. a great winter resource for our bees. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you encourage a variety of plants so that you can have blooms year round to, to feed the pollinators. Yeah. And yeah. these are these are just some great examples. There's a clover down there, and um, just these these little daisy like uh, I don't want to call them weeds because they are they are they're wildflowers. So um, they're wildflowers. Yeah, uh, weeds is weeds is a dirty name for wildflowers. It, is, it really is. So yeah. Well, um, and the clover is something, and we learned this because <clears throat> at the, um, the farm we had lots of clover, and doing just a little bit of research, clover puts nitrogen back in the soil. So, yeah. you know, let the clover grow. It's going to, if you're letting it grow over your lawn, it's just going to help your lawn. Mm -hmm. If you're letting it grow over in a garden, it's just going to help your garden. Um, and again, you know, people look mm -hmm. at it as a weed, but it it's, has so many more benefits beyond just being a pollinator, you know, right. um, attractive. It's edible. Clover's yeah, edible. edible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They went and dandelions, honestly, right? I was going to mention dandelions too, because they dandelions too. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there's a lot of things in our environment that we can eat that um, that we just we've lost track of. Yeah. Oh, oh, also, if we weren't so hooked on green lawns, those are actually very attractive flowers. Yeah. Yeah. You could have a whole uh, lawn uh, uh, just of clover, and you could yeah. have 16 different colored flowers out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, these, these next pictures are my favorite. Do you want me to go ahead and show these? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, and I'll, I'll keep talking. The, uh, sure. the most important thing that you can do for the pollinators, besides all these things we've listed, is to um, educate others. So, mm -hmm. tell, tell people what you've learned and that, you know, that pesticides are dangerous for all of us and um, that we need, we need variety in life to have a balanced environment and, and a healthy life. Yeah, and so here's a, a garden before, and then. This just shows how much you can do with a small area. They, yeah. have, they have so much diversity in this tiny little area. And it's really cute. And that, that looks like, you know, of course we're in South Alabama. So we're, I think our, our climate's a little different than, than North or Northern Alabama, but this is, you know, I mean, we're in subtropical climate. So, and this looks like a subtropical. Yeah. Yeah. I, all these things I see here can, can mm -hmm. grow well here. Um, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's so it much is. prettier than just the plain old grass. And it, it holds the moisture in the environment. Um, it keeps the area cooler. Mm -hmm provides all those flowers. Yep. So, and let's talk a little bit, let's get a little bit more specific. Um, I know you wanted to really talk about honeybees in general. Yeah, so we're gonna um, just sort of finish up our talk with uh, how honeybees can help fill, you know, fill in the pollination puzzle. Um, so uh, they, um, one thing about honeybees is uh, that they they forage a great diversity of things. Um, uh, Dad was telling me this morning that they uh, there's at least a hundred different of our food crops that we know that honeybees pollinate that we can use honeybees to pollinate. 
Um, plus all the other little things that grow out in the wild. I know I go out and pick elderberries, um, mm -hmm. bees pollinate them. So uh, loquats, I enjoyed loquats from our loquat tree yesterday for the first time this season. Thanks to the bees that were there in December pollinating yeah. their flowers. That's another good uh, winter crop for bees. They love yeah. loquat. <laughs> They do. Oh, and it smells so nice too. Mm -hmm. um, another way that the bees, the honeybees in particular, makes them good pollinators is that they've got strength in numbers. They live in colonies of up to 50,000 or more. Um, and so when they're out foraging, they are working like mules for their, mm -hmm. their colony. They're working on coming back with just as much as they possibly can and turning around, going straight back out and getting it again, so. Um, and I think one thing that we need to kind of dispel is the myth that bees are dangerous and they're gonna, they're gonna chase you down and sting you. I mean, that's not at all true, at all No, true. no, no. Um, I get stung quite often and it is always my fault, absolutely every time. <laughs> it's um, either I'm in their house digging around and they don't want me there, or I have been recently, or um, one lands on me and I startle and swat at it. That's usually how people get stung. Um, bees are actually pretty clumsy flyers and they bump into you and they just sort of need to readjust before they take off again. So if you can just give them a second or you know maybe blow at them or something, but don't, don't put that hand up. Right, right. And um, that's what I tell my, my boys. It's like, if a bee is just checking you out, it's like, just be still, no sudden yeah, thing. They're just they're very out. intelligent very curious um and they uh when they're out foraging they're they're focused on getting their right. food and taking it home they they don't compete with each other out in the the, the flowers they don't um they'll forage right alongside wasps yeah. and um you mark you makes know, the dream work so right so yeah. um so yeah they're they're really they're really not dangerous unless you go poking around and making trouble right um right. And, Which beekeepers uh, do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we do it. Yeah. Um, so uh, another way honeybees can be kept where we need them for food pollination. Um, they they don't really care where you move their box as long as it's a suitable location and there's food to eat. They'll mm -hmm. they'll co come back to that box. Yeah. Okay. That sounds great. This has all yes. been really interesting information. And like I said, I know, I know we met briefly just to kind of go over everything on Friday and I learned so much then and I've learned even more now. So thank you guys so much. I cannot wait well, for next month. So. I have one more, one more yes. really important point to make that we've been Please. talking about is um, the diversity is that, yeah. you know, we're backyard beekeeping and urban beekeeping can pick up some of those fill some of those gaps of, of mm -hmm. pollinators that are the native pollinators that are missing. They, they can't do all of it. We really, really need mm -hmm. to allow um, for native pollinators in, in our spaces right. to take right. care, take care of everything. Well, like you said, and, and like, like I just recently learned from you guys is that they're, you know, they're, they're certain bees. They have, you know, they like their, they're like their certain flavors. And right. some don't you do the squash blossoms and some do. So, you know, I just, I had, and I, it makes, I guess, total sense, but I just never thought about, you know, certain types of bees preferring how specific it gets. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, yeah. So, yeah, so and like, like the, is it the fig wasp that is actually in the fig or winds up in the fig somehow? Is that a pollinator too? Or is that just a myth that I've heard? I'm not aware of it pollinating. I think they're using the, <laughs> they might be a little bit of a pest actually since they- Oh, okay. Um, okay. Never mind. So- There are, I there are plenty of insects that, uh, that right. are, are pests in that way. Right. And actually some of the, some of the predatory or, or more specifically the parasitic wasps yes. actually selectively lay their eggs in the larvae of those insects. And uh, if you ever if you ever go to your garden and you see a, a tomato hornworm or something with a bunch of little white bodies right. on it, those are <laughs> that's the result of a mama wasp laying eggs inside that uh, that larva, which is going to become the food for her offspring yeah. once they yeah. once they hatch. So, yeah. 
Yeah, because yeah, I think I think um, Veronica, you had uh, one of the pictures uh, back there was a pollinator and a predator. So it was yeah, a lot. Really, a lot of the wasps are pollinators okay. and predators. And like you said, the fig wasp, it may be that the adult wasp pollinates the flowers. Possibly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of those predatory wasps, they eat pollen, but their babies have to have meat mm -hmm. protein. Yeah. So, well, I mean, they, they eat the nectar from the flowers, right. but the babies right. have to have meat. And so they'll pick off caterpillars and, wow. and, you know, flies and other things like that, take them home to feed their babies. That's just fascinating. So fascinating. Thanks so much, guys. And now we are open to questions. If you want to ask in the chat or if you'd like to take yourself off of mute, if you have any questions for Veronica or Dawn, um, they are happy to answer them. And um, if they don't have the answer today, like I said, we're going to have them back next, next month so they can research and find the answer. Um, let's see. Again, feel free to take yourself off of chat if you do have a question or you can ask it or, or take yourself off of mute, I'm sorry, or you can ask it in chat. It's a Monday, y'all have to excuse me. I don't know, no questions. I think I think well, y'all did, did such a great job. You must so. have covered it all. I think yeah. so. I, think I um, just wanna say, I really appreciate y'all letting us come do this and talk to y'all today. Uh, it's, it's very important to tell everybody how important the pollinators are. Hi, this is, hi, this is Wesley. I have one question about those carpenter bees. Yes, sir, do they, go for it. Do they, do they also burrow or lay, make their nests in the, in the ground like the standard American, you know, bumblebee, the? No, um, no. Um, bumblebees are uh, a colonial, so they she'll build that nest in the ground where she can have lots and lots of babies. And the um, carpenter bees have have one up in there. They just uh, dig one little hole and feed that one little baby. Ah, uh, so ah, uh, so it's very very different. They're solitary. Oh yeah. Yes. Now bumblebees That's don't produce the kind of populations that honeybees do. Their their no. their hives are a lot small. Colonies are a lot smaller, but. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the season, they, they break down and only the queen overwinters. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, they really decrease in the winter. Yeah. I'm, I'm, up, in, I'm up in New Jersey. Um, I heard, I was reading, um, might've been from Audubon. I forget a few months ago that the uh, bumblebee population has really suffered the American bumblebee. That's really in much of the States. It's yes. really uh, taking a hit. Yes. And it's pesticides. Yeah, it's pesticides. And uh, bumblebees are very, very important pollinators. Uh, they yeah. they're they're so fat and fluffy um, that when they when they're at a flower, their wings are flapping so fast that their whole body's vibrating and mm -hmm. it causes more pollen to spread. And it's really good. Um, there are actually some berry farms out in California that use kept bumblebees in greenhouses mm -hmm. to pollinate because their type of pollination is called buzz pollination produces more berries than honeybees would. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. They're like you say, they're bigger. There's more yeah. mass. They're fuzzier, fuzzier. and there's uh, yeah. more vibration. Yeah, they're just there's more of them to uh, stir things up. I guess, huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, their populations, wonderful... their populations are a lot smaller than honeybees as well. And so, when you start yeah. with a relatively small population, the extent to which pesticides decrease that further is kind of magnified. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I I hear you. Yeah, that's a. It's a real concern. Boy, I, I definitely hear you. Thank you both of you for the wonderful, wonderful talk. Thanks for checking in with us. Thank you, Mr. Absolutely. Wesley. Thanks for that Thank great you. question. That was really great. All right, folks. Well, um, I have Don and Veronica's email address up here if you'd like to ask them any questions. Um, honeyofthehill at yahoo.com. So uh, they are more than welcome. Uh, they're welcoming you to uh, email them, ask them questions. And um, like I said, we're going to see them next time. I'm so excited. Um, next month in May, first Monday in May, we're going to be talking about beekeeping. So we've talked about how important bees are. And so now we're going to talk about how you can maybe get started on your own little type of beekeeping or, or just, you know, continue to attract and uh, bees and pollinators to your yard to uh, continue the, that all important process. And then in June, we're going to be uh, talking with the Mobile Medical Museum on the history of medicinal plants. So that's going to be really interesting, too. We'll have Darren Glassbrook, the executive director 
of Mobile Medical Museum on to talk about that. But um, Veronica, Don, thank you so much. This has just been a delight to have you on. And Tarrant, thank you so much for um, the idea and uh, recruiting them. And uh, this has just been great. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, folks, this again, this has been recorded. Um, we are going to have it up on our YouTube page, um, the recording, and we are going to rebroadcast this on our Facebook page in case you missed it. Um, we'll probably do that later this month, probably around the 20th of April or so. But um, Don, Veronica, Tarrant, thank you all so much for all of this great knowledge. It's been great. Great. Thanks for having us. And with that, folks, I am going to end the Zoom. Have a great day and a great week, everyone. You too, Dorothy. Bye. Thank you very much.